This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast exploring hot topics and exciting advances in childhood cancer. TWIPO is produced by Solving Kids Cancer, nonprofits located in New York and London, dedicated to improving research and supporting families, because every kid deserves to grow up. Subscribe to TWIPO through your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast about hot topics and new advances in childhood cancer. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Kreit from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, affiliated with The Ohio State University. To find archives of all the TWIPO podcasts and webcasts, visit solvingkidscancer.org slash podcast or iTunes slash Apple Podcasts or Google Play Podcasts. So thank you all for joining us today. We'll be discussing a really distinctive and elegant paper recently published in Nature Medicine, highlighting a novel immunotherapy approach for children with metastatic medulloblastoma and ependymoma. As many of you know, uh, brain tumors are the most common solid tumor in children and the most deadly. So this is a very, very important topic. And I'm joined today by the lead authors of the paper, Dr. Michael Taylor, a pediatric neurosurgeon and head of the Taylor Lab at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto, and also a prolific published author in many, many journals. Thank you for being here, Michael. My pleasure. And also join a co-senior author, Dr. Nabil Ahmed, a physician scientist from Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital, whose lab focuses on translational research for adoptive immunotherapy for children with brain tumors. So it's very exciting to have you here. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. So first, I'd like to just show everybody the paper here. And I counted the number of authors. There's 56 authors, six figures, 10 extended data figures, and 15 supplemental figures for a total of 131 figures. It's quite a tome of work. So congratulations on you uh, to you guys on this uh, on this this work. Can you tell me what it was like to sort of bring all these people together and how challenging that is? I think we should point out that the first author is a a, uh, an amazing scientist by the name of Dr. Laura Donovan, who came to my laboratory from the United Kingdom and has now returned to England to start her own laboratory. And she certainly carried most of the water for for this project. While there were a large number of people who contributed to these hundreds of mice that were treated just like human children as patients on clinical trials, Laura was the one who really drove it every day and who, who made it happen. So Everybody on that paper, everybody on the paper certainly deserves credit, but Laura deserves to be atop the podium with the gold medal on. Fantastic. What's she up to now? Just starting her own lab. Uh, she just moved back home from Canada back to the UK. She's going to start her own lab studying the use of immunotherapies to treat children with brain tumors. That's great. Uh, you know, we don't often talk as much about trainees and the importance of trainees. Uh, to, to populate the future of the world of research, clinical research, translational research. So it's great to hear that she's had this kind of success and is starting out on her own. I'm trying to make my lab as metastatic as possible, Tim. <laughs> so tell me about how it is, though, to work together with all these different people. What challenges did you have getting things done down at Baylor or wherever? Because you actually, there are a bunch of countries represented by these authors. Um, well, I'll, I'll say something quickly, and then I think you should hear from Nabil, but to be honest, I didn't find it any much of a challenge at all. Uh, in the days of email, Nabil is just as close as somebody who's three offices over. And in fact, he might be closer in the era of COVID because who's actually going to see each other in person? That's true. Um, and, you know, we're all, everybody who's involved in this is all people who want to find novel therapies for kids that really have no options and who are likely going to pass away from their disease. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very easy thing to get behind, I would say. Nabila, you concur? I, I absolutely concur. I mean, the, one of the best things that has happened over the last several years is that we've joined forces. Uh, Laura Donovan is a fantastic young researcher who's both professionally and socially smart, you know, and has been enabled quite a bit by uh, Michael, who is extremely collaborative. Uh, we have worked on making engineering uh, uh, T cells, make CAR T cells. He has, for many, many years, uh, studied the personalities of these tumors uh, in depth. Uh, and, and getting together was really uh, a treat. I think we, we uh, synergized beautifully. We really enjoyed the last, uh, what, Michael, five years maybe uh, working on this together. 
I think it was a little longer actually because five and a half years probably. Yeah. Yeah, these kinds of uh, uh, tomes of work t take a long time, but also a lot of money. Uh, how did you get it funded? I think everybody in my lab is down a kidney. <laughs> no, I, 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 Nabil, I guess we would, we would probably, you know, there's funding comes from all over, but the principal source of funding was from Stand Up to Cancer and their pediatric dream team. Uh, they are a wonderful supporter of work in my laboratory and Nabil's laboratory and a team led by John Marist and Crystal Mackle. Um, all together, that team's been working together to find a number of new immunotherapies for a number of different childhood cancers. Uh, we've really enjoyed working together as a team, and I think we've been very productive together. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, they're also on the uh, Moonshot grants with me uh, that we joined this year, so we're excited about that collaboration uh, yeah. to find new targets, uh, immunotherapy targets in pediatric cancers. So let's dive into the science a little bit. Uh, can you just give us a brief overview of what the approach or the idea was and how you came up with it? Sure. Um, most of the kids that die from ependymoma or medulloblastoma don't die from the primary tumor. Uh, most children survive their initial resection and then chemotherapy if they have medullo and their radiation if they, if they have either ependymoma or radiation. And if the children die for the most part, it's because the tumor has recurred and when it recurs, it usually quite a bit of time it recurs either metastatically on the surface of the brain of the spinal cord or with ependymoma, if it recurs locally, it's small and the recurrence is also adjacent to the CSF. So unlike GBM or glioblastoma that grows within the brain, medulloblastoma and ependymoma grow on the brain. They never seem to be able to manage to get inside the brain. So that's actually kind of different, right? When you want to get a drug to a glioblastoma, you've got to get it through the blood-brain barrier. If you want to get a drug to a medulloblastoma met or an ependymoma met or recurrence, you could get it through the blood-brain barrier because they're still attached to the brain, but you could also get it into the CSF because that's where all the action is. And we were wondering when Nabil and I started talking about using CAR T cells to treat these diseases, whether or not the CAR T cells would, if we put them into the blood, like people have done in the past, whether they would know to go from the blood into the CSF space, CSF is cerebral spinal fluid, I should have said that, uh, to kill the cancer. We didn't know if they'd be smart enough. I'm a very direct person. I'm a surgeon. I like direct solutions to what I see as simple problems. And I didn't understand why we were putting these cells into the blood when the cancer wasn't in the blood. Why didn't we just put them into the cerebral spinal fluid where the, the tumor was and kill the tumor? I think a lot of people were kind of hesitant at first, uh, more about safety uh, than about efficacy, but there was worry about worries about efficacy Certainly worries about safety, about having them in high concentration, you know, right, right adjacent to the central nervous system. Uh, so Nabil and I talked about it. My laboratory for a long time now has been interested in what we call mouse hospital approaches to translational research, which is where we take a mouse that has a disease that's very similar to what a human child has, and then we treat the mouse with the exact same therapy that the human children get in the exact same way. Sometimes we operate on the mice under general anesthesia using microneurosurgery, and then we give them post-operative care with corticosteroids, pain relief, and fluids. Uh, sometimes we give them craniospinal radiation using a CAT scan to little mice, CAT scan guided radiation. So if our, our idea was that we wanted to put CAR T cells right into the CSF space, right on the surface of the brains and spinal cords of children with cancer, we figured that we should first model that disease in the mouse and then put the CAR T cells right in where the action was. Um, so we worked on establishing the models in my laboratory, the, the metastatic models. And Nabil is our expert on CAR T cells and everything immuno because I don't know the difference between a B and a T cell. And once we mixed that chocolate and peanut butter, we now had a mouse hospital sort of patient driven kind of a model and ability to ask a question, is it safe and is it effective to just take the CAR T cells and deliver them right to where the tumor is and stop mucking about. It sounds like the, every great study probably has a one key insight and maybe just putting them right in there was, was your key insight. Uh, and it, so that's, that's terrific. What, um, what, how challenging is that? I mean, a mouse is pretty small CF, see, I don't know what the volume of CSF is, but it can't be very much. So, uh, you know, how easy it is to, we, we all miss enough in, in people 
let, let them own mice. So how challenging was that technically? Uh, to tell you the truth, Dr. Donovan did most of that work along with some, uh, some other really valued uh, people in my laboratory. And w once you've done it enough times, it's, it's like anything in surgery. You, know, you do it enough times, we like to say, see one, do one, teach one, right? Um, it's probably more like see five, do 100 than teach 500. But uh, <laughs> once you've done it a lot of times, it's not difficult. Because we're, we're not really doing anything new with, with these animals. We're, you know, uh, everything, we're just kind of mimicking what we would do if it was a human toddler. Um, and the, the ventricles might be small, but they're in the middle of the head. That's what we always tell my neurosurgery residents, right? When we're having trouble changing the catheter when we're fixing a shunt. The, the, you know, the juice is in the middle of the orange. Stick the straw in the middle of the orange. Right. <laughs> Words to live by. So you started out the paper by describing or searching for what kind of appropriate targets, immunotherapy targets, might be present on these diseases. Can you tell us a little bit about those studies you did, data mining and, and uh, human sample uh, testing? Nabil, do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, so I mean, so, so, so from our perspective, this was really a, a treat. I mean, this was a very uh, great opportunity because what Michael speaks as, as bread and butter for us is novel, right? Mm -hmm. And what we do is very different from what he does. Coming together, uh, this really was a great opportunity. Uh, the, the targets have been, have been around. We've tested them. And as a fellow, I worked on uh, HER2 in medulloblastoma. Uh, cell lines, you know, I try to get some, some cell drive from patients, primary cells. But here I have this man who has a prolific surgeon who is probably, I can guess, that Michael does not operate on anybody without studying their tumor. So it's a massive database of, of tumors that are real. And uh, uh, one of the most attractive things that I, I liked uh, about uh, um, his presentation, that kind of we, we established this collaboration, is um, his wanting to treat tumors in reality, not, 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 no pretend. So no lines, uh, although lines have their own functions, but uh, the tumor, after they have been gone through the ugliness, the evolution of ugliness through multiple lines of treatment. So here we have uh, mice that can have a tumor that uh, looks like a tumor at diagnosis, but also mice that have tumors uh, that look like tumors when they're about to kill the patient. Uh, so we're treating reality. This, this is what we treat in the clinical trials. And we've done clinical trials for 15 years here at Baylor at Texas Children's. Uh, but this was a golden opportunity to study the antigens in these very advanced tumors and also to treat these tumors as they are. So they're very close to our patients. And I actually fancied how they called it, you know, Lauren and Michael, they called it clinical trials in mice. Uh, and, and this is how we said it. The whole paper, if you look at it, is almost a series of clinical trials shrunken down into in the mouse world. Why uh, almost? <laughs> say it again. Why almost? They, they are. They are shrunken down. So you have uh, the figures are basically layers of consequential uh, clinical trials that, that are building findings on top of each other from what is the best target. We go into hundreds of tumors uh, with Michael. He looks at them and he, 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 he tells us, he reinvents this. Uh, in a very realistic manner. So we've treated uh, medulla with, for instance, as an example, with her to CAR T cells. We actually do have a clinical trial open now at Baylor, but it looks like there is some other target that we have been uh, targeting. EPHA2 is, is a winner. It's, the, it's a golden. Uh, 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 and when, when, we, when we do it locally, regionally, it's almost like we've, we've stepped up. Uh, it, it's a very important fact that, that we all probably know is that the targets in solid cancers are, uh, quite, they, they overlap with the targets uh, in, the, in, in the normal tissues quite a bit. So uh, it, it is very important. Such an approach will allow you to go into what becomes toxic if you give it intravenously. You're giving it with a very high uh, uh, concentration right into the tumor they get activated appropriately, and you can elicit an immune response. We hope to look at this in the clinical trial. Can you elicit an immune response that is broader than, than what you target? Uh, and you can only elicit an immune response that is broader than what you target if you uh, do a meaningful enough injury to the, to the tumor by targeting appropriately using appropriate doses of T cells. So this is, I think, uh, the, the key beauty of this trial is that it has brought two teams together has answered a very simple question. 
uh, low cohesional delivery. Can we do this and can this be meaningful or not? You, you brought up, uh, I think, a really important aspect of the CAR-T field or, or targeted immunotherapies in general, and that is the normal expression. And you did show in your paper differential with some of them, although one of the targets actually was on par with normal expression. But uh, yeah. these aren't targets that are exclusively selectively on the tumor. As you mentioned, they're normal, some normal tissue expression for some of them. And your solution is this local regional uh, administration to limit the systemic exposure and therefore limit the off or on target, uh, but off tumor toxicity. What um, have, did you look carefully in the, you know, the mouse isn't going to be the best uh, model for that, right? Because normal mouse tissue may not be uh, the same as normal human tissue in terms of uh, recognizing the exact target or the levels of expression. So I think that's probably one caveat of your study, right? That the, there could be side effects systemically that that show up in people that didn't show up in the mice. What is your concern or your worry about that? And how will that uh, inform when you go into the clinic? I think when we chose these, Tim, uh, so the, the way we, we prioritized targets was Nabil made a list of already established CAR T cell targets for which there was a construct that could be made. And we preferentially prioritize the ones that had already been shown to be safe and used in humans. And then we went down that list to see which of them were the most highly expressed in our, our two villains, medulloblastoma and ependymoma. So th this was sort of a win-win-win. The idea was we would find something that was already on the shelf, so we didn't have to make it new, uh, and that had been used in humans for, in, you know, intravenously for treating non-brain tumors or whatever, so that we knew that there was some element of safety. And then we could show that it was highly expressed in our, our two villains, and we were going to, you know, instead of giving them a map of the city, we were going to drive them right to the villain's house. Yeah. Drop all our goons off right outside their doors. <laughs> I love it. It's, 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 it's interesting. It's almost like a, you know, a Trojan war, a, a Trojan a horse. You know, it's, and, and it's almost a rediscovery of targets that, uh, that have been shown before uh, to, to, be, to, be, uh, uh, to be, to a certain degree, safe, even infused outside of the central nervous system, overcoming this big hurdle, which is the blood-brain barrier, and putting much bigger doses inside into the tissue. Yeah, now T cells are known to migrate, right? So they could ex exit the, C the, C the CNS and, and hit peripheral tissues. So, and then proliferate there, it's a living drug. So uh, yes. I guess that still is, should, should be noted as a potential uh, possibility, I guess. It absolutely is. And I think the way to answer this, uh, uh, this question is in a carefully designed clinical trial. Tim, I'm not sure I'm upset about that, to be honest though, because I don't think we understand the biology of recurrence and particularly metastatic recurrence, medulloblastoma and to a lesser extent medulloblastoma. Uh, I, sus I suspect that there are reservoirs of medulloblastoma cells hiding elsewhere in the body other than the leptomeningeal surface, such as the bone marrow. So for example, I think if we work really hard and we cure leptomeningeal medulloblastoma, and we come up with some great drug, I think those kids are going to come back with bone marrow mets and stuff like that. Yeah. So if some of those, some of those cells are out there in the periphery, make, maybe they can look for, for rogue bad guys and, and go kill them in the bone marrow too. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. And, and metastasis. Cottage. Yeah. Metastasis it's, 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 also, it's also where you load your medication, where you load your therapeutic or biologic. You know, if, if, if you need to load it outside of the CNS with the target being in the CNS, it's different from loading it outside and, and hoping that some would escape to take care of, you know, the minimum residual disease outside of the neuro axis. Yeah. So um, it, it is a very direct uh, 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 approach, probably with very sophisticated biology that we need to study more. So we only have about a few minutes left, but I thought maybe we could show people what we're talking about by putting one of the, your figures on the screen, uh, if you don't mind. And um, I'll just share my screen. And if, if you can see that, maybe you could walk everyone through this schema at the top, and then we can show them the data we're talking about. Sure. So that the cartoon at the top just kind of describes the, the way that the clinical trial works. The animals first implanted 
with a uh, human patient derived medulloblastoma or pneumoma, and that's allowed to grow because, you know, there's no sense if you treat the tumor the day after you put it in before it's kind of moved its stuff in and it's all established, you're cheating, right? And made vessels as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you got to wait till they're vascularized and they have vessels and they've, they've unpacked all their stuff and they feel at home and then fight them. Cause if you fight them before that, uh, it's, 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 it's not like the situation where you'll be fighting them when you're actually treating a child. And so once the tumor is properly established and we can document that using luciferase, then the animals would be treated with an intracranial, rather an intraventricular injection of the CAR T cells that were prepared by Nabil and his team down in Houston. Sometimes the CAR T cells were given once, sometimes they were given twice. Uh, as a control, different animals were given them intravenously as opposed to inside the ventricular system. And the, I guess the overall conclusion, and then we would follow the animals to see how long they survived after therapy versus controls, or indeed if we cured any of them, which was the hope, right? Um, and we followed them over time. And, and sure enough, that what we were able to see is the addition of CAR T cells is better than just giving the, the T cells that are not turned into CAR T cells or doing nothing alone. And some of the CAR T cells were better than other CAR T cells and giving more than one dose of CAR T cells was better than giving one dose of CAR T cells alone. Is that a fair summary, Nabil? Did I miss anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you look at it, I mean, I would like to point out that the, the it, this is a 300 day. This is a half, almost half of a lifetime of a mouse. So this is a very long term experiment uh, with a lot of work, also, of course, put into it. But the significance is also important as it's a very long term experiment. This is what you would expect to see. The, the tumors have fairly grown up by the time we they were treated and uh, and uh, uh, I think it just speaks for itself. Yeah, just to orient people if they're not aware of what the the chart is, is this percent uh, survival or uh, proportion. So 100% at the top essentially and uh, days at the bottom uh, over time. And so each time an animal needed, uh, didn't survive their cancer, there's a, a dot. Um, so you've got the, the treatment group here with, in this case, with the uh, FA2 CAR T with the azacitidine. Tell us, tell us about the azacitidine and what the role that played in this study. Nabil, do you want to? Uh, sure. I mean, azacitidine is an epigenetic inhibitor. It, it, it prevents some of the changes that can happen to the DNA, uh, potentially under stress. And uh, when tumors see CAR T cells, therapeutic T cells, they're under stress and they do everything to survive, including these some genetic changes that can um, alter the targets. The tumors are, are evolutionarily smart. They, uh, if you target EPHA2, they will try to get rid of it, but also survive. It's uh, like, like removing a marker, you know? Uh, somebody identifies you as having glasses, you take off the glasses and you become invisible uh, to the immune system. Uh, and, and tumors do this exactly. They, we have seen this uh, uh, in, in our group. We've seen it has been shown in leukemia. You target CD19 in leukemia. The tumor cells eliminate CD19 and survive, and the patients have progressive disease. One of the ways we can get over this is by uh, targeting more than one antigen. Uh, another way of, taking, of, of, of overcoming this escape of the tumors or resistance by the tumors is to find a way where the tumor is not able to uh, to hide and remove the glasses, uh, st stabilize the antigen, stabilize the targets. So we force them to put on the glasses like Dr. Michael Taylor has put on the glasses now. If he doesn't take off the glasses, he cannot see anything. So he's become addicted to the glasses. That's not true. Those are just readers, Nabil. <laughs> I just wear the glasses to look cool. I'm pulling a Clark, Clark, pulling a Clark Kent. Yes. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So, 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 so azacitidine is is, and we're working on the mechanism a little bit more. Uh, hopefully, with Michael Taylor as part of the uh, uh, the clinical trial, but also with one of his apprentices that we we managed to steal and uh, kidnap uh, into Texas Children's. Uh, 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 he and he, like you said, he's metastasized. Uh, in, Dr. In Steve Mack did his PhD in my lab, and then a postdoc with Dr. Jeremy Rich in Cleveland, and he's now a faculty with Nabil's 
program down in Houston, and he's, he's a fantastic young scientist doing great work on ependymoma and glioblastoma. He's a great colleague to us now. So we're working on this and, 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 and to see uh, the mechanism by which as a cytidine, as a stabilizer uh, to, to the, these DNA events would make the tumor not be able to escape, not be able to adapt to the therapeutic stress. And again, if you look at this uh, survival curve, you'd see a very drastic uh, increase in the survival just by adding a medication that in and of itself does not have a lot of effect, doesn't have any effect. On, on the tumor on its own, a little bit of effect, tiny bit. But here you see it increases survival by about three times. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I think this is the teaser in the paper. This is the finding that will provoke the collaborators to continue to work together to find out uh, an answer to this question. Yeah, I liked how in the discussion you said, this works great, but we're not sure how, so we're gonna, that'll yeah. be the next time. We're not sure now, hopefully, hopefully in the future. So my final, we need to wrap this up quickly, but my final question is really about how, what's it gonna to take to bring this to the clinical trials, to what kind of uh, reception do you expect from IRB, FDA, et cetera? How challenging is it gonna to be to produce these? Uh, you said they're already made in some cases, but to get something really into patients, what is your anticipation? I can't cope with bureaucrats, so that's a Nabil, that's a Nabil question. <laughs> well, we'll turn that over to Nabil. The bureaucrats make me wanna apop toes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope I hope it doesn't. It's it's uh, it, it's uh, it, it's um, I don't want to call it a challenging a challenging uh, uh, process, but it is a process, and the process uh, uh, is intended to protect and make sure that things are done properly uh, by regulators. And and we've we've had a good experience. It's just a timely uh, uh, process. Uh, this is one of the things, and I think we would have a positive experience doing this. And this is what we hope to do, uh, to bring winner molecules uh, into the clinic uh, in carefully designed clinical trials. We would have to discuss this. Uh, first, I mean, do, do our homework, put a protocol that entails acceptable risk in this con the context of such diseases and test increasing doses of this uh, uh, using these routes, uh, uh, presented to our IRB and the FDA and uh, um, a good thing is that the, the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy is part of Texas Children's and Baylor and the Methodist Hospital has had many, many years doing this, uh, this kind of translation. So we're hoping to put this through. Um, of course, this entails uh, also quite a bit of expenses, moving things from the non-clinical grade into the clinical grade uh, pieces of DNA, uh, T cells, and, and, uh, and the procedure of making them in a way that is almost pharmaceutical grade to be given to the patients. I guess my question is though, are you ready to start doing that, even though if it might take several years and a lot of work and money, or do you need more preclinical data? It's a no, very thick no paper. More. That's no a very more. thick paper. This is as, as close as it gets to a, a, a first in child clinical trial. It's a first in child clinical trial done in a mouse. Yeah. Uh, now we need to first in human child. We've done first in mouse. Now we just need to move to another mammal. We've yes. done one mammal, now we move to a second mammal. This, this second mammal has more expensive cage costs. I'm not uh, sure that's true. We are expensive people. So, uh, great. So I'm not going to hold you to it, but you're thinking a year, three years, five years, 10 years, what are you hoping? What's your goal? Uh, we, we just started now, uh, 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 we just started today actually on, on the process of writing the protocol. Uh, we will do an IND and, and I would say a year from now, hopefully, if we're, if we're good, if we work on it diligently. That's great news. And of, course, um, if we have, and of course, if you have the support, the financial support. Yes. It's quite a bit, yeah. Yes, well, that's fantastic. I think that's a great uh, optimistic way to, to end this, this video cast. I appreciate your both being on. It's been a great discussion, and congratulations on your work. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. It's, yeah, our honor. Just, I'm just going to end with the the... the tagline that we usually end our podcast with to thank Solving Kids Cancer for their support of this uh, series. And remember, the more we learn, communicate, share ideas, and work together, the faster we'll reach the day when all childhood cancer is preventable or curable. As always, keep up the fight, and thanks for listening to This Week in Pediatric Oncology. We welcome your comments, questions, or thoughts on topics for future episodes. Just drop us a note at twipo at solvingkidscancer.org. You can follow Dr. Kripe on Twitter at kidsonkdoc 
and find all TWIPLA episodes at solvingkidscancer.org.